Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how how long do I have here? Forty minutes or so, or within the hour? Okay, okay. Okay. When people start leaving, then I should start wrapping it up. Yeah. Actually, this is um, this is me. I took this photograph oh, really? in the lab. So, so we wanted to. So, this is an inverted tweezer setup that we, we built, and we wanted to actually run a super continuum through to do a spectroscopy of our nano apertures. And we found out that it gave us like really great light. Mm -hmm. And and then like we had these like blue and red. And so I was like, oh, let's take a picture. <laughs> and so I was like, put on your lab coats. <laughs> They always had the goggles, actually, but the goggles are nice because it like kind of picks up the monitor, the the TV screen, uh, the, the that's right, yeah. yeah. So so it's kind of fun. So that's Yunjae Pang. He left my group and he went to work at University of Michigan on HIV and um, got some nice papers out of that. Then he went back to Toronto and got a Nature paper on nice. on some of the other stuff. So and that's Anna, and she works for Intel now. Okay. <laughs> I remember our best photos were still with uh, secrets. Oh yeah, 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 cigarette smoke, you know. So you shouldn't do that, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we have temporary permission. Yeah. Actually, Maxim Zeninkov, I think, blew a blue smoke in our cavity. That sounds like something a Russian would do. Yeah, yeah. so we can, mm -hmm. could actually receive the beams. <laughs> now you have to clean the mirrors. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, thank you for having me here. This is a uh, very impressive uh, facilities I've seen this morning already, and uh, a nice seminar series. And I'm glad that you guys get to have some lunch here. Uh, okay, so huh, that's not working. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, I don't know really who I'm speaking to. So I'm, uh, show of hands, who knows what optical tweezers are? Okay, so I, about half of you. Okay, so uh, optical tweezers use the momentum of light to manipulate small objects, okay? So light, uh, photons, they don't have mass, but they do have momentum. And if you have a laser beam, for example, that's focused down, uh, this laser beam is going to scatter off of an object. And so these photons that were going in this direction are now going to be changing their direction uh, to go that way. And so there's a change in momentum, so there's a force, okay? And that force will push this particle uh, the, the, the photons are going that way, that force will push the particle back towards the center of the beam. Okay? So in these types of optical tweezers, the tendency is to pull the particle towards the highest intensity region of the beam. Okay? Uh, and this uh, force can be written in terms of the gradients of the electric field, uh, in, or the field squared, uh, the, the intensity essentially. And, um, and so that's what works to bring the particle closer. The problem is though that, uh, you know, um, this for, for Rayleigh particles, for particles that are small in the wavelength of light, this polarizability term scales as a third power. So 
So you can, this works really nicely for things that are like uh, between 100 nanometers and a micron, okay? But going below the uh, 100 nanometers, all of a sudden this, these forces become too small, okay? Because of this. Uh, it's just this really third power dependence makes it quite hard to trap small things. Now Arthur Ashkin, uh, who was doing some of the first experiments on this, uh, the first gradient force tweezers, even in the first work uh, where he did this, he, he realized that to go below 100 nanometers, you could do 109 nanometers, um, and you would actually end up destroying the, the particles or, or something would happen to them. Uh, but if you went smaller, then, then you weren't gonna, you weren't gonna be able to hold on to these particles uh, for very much longer. So, so this limitation has been there since the beginning. So, like I said, these tweezers are really good for anything in this range. Uh, you know, if you want to look at bigger things, they're great. Uh, people have trapped bacteria, red blood cells. This is very common, commonplace in, in the optical tweezer community these days. But what we want to do is really move it down to one nanometer up to 50 nanometers, where traditional optical tweezers don't really work that well. Okay, so that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. And in this regime, you might want to look at things like proteins, single proteins, uh, protein complexes, virus particles or virons, uh, some DNA, uh, or you might look at some colloidal particles or carbon matter. Um, so, so there's lots of interesting things to study in that regime. Uh, and so, so that's where we want to go. Obviously, some of the work I've seen has gone even smaller today, has gone even smaller than that to the molecular. And you might want to use some other approaches, like the ones that you're developing here. But I think really for solution-based studies um, of proteins and things like that, this is a really nice technique because it really uh, it captures the right size range. So what is our trick? We have a trick, okay? Um, a trick is to use apertures in metal films, okay? And uh, Eric started by saying that, you know, I'm doing plasmonics. This doesn't really have to be plasmonics. This is a property of, of apertures in metal films. Uh, so uh, Beta, Hans Beta, basically came up with a theory which describes how light transmits through apertures. And he said, okay, not a lot of light gets through when the aperture is smaller than the, the wavelength of light. In fact, it goes as the fourth power. So before I showed you polarizability, which went to the third power, this is even smaller. It goes as the fourth power, okay? So the transmission goes down pretty rapidly uh, as you make the aperture smaller than the wavelength of light. But now you put a particle inside the aperture, all of a sudden you've made the aperture, as far as light is concerned, you've made the aperture bigger because you've uh, put a refractive index material into the, into the aperture. Uh, the wavelength of light in a refractive index material goes down by the refractive index. And so essentially you shrink in the light or you're allowing more light to transmit through the aperture. And this is exactly what happens. You get this large amount of extra photons running through this aperture, and these give you more force on the particle. So your transmission goes up. Uh, you're basically just shifting this curve to the right because you're increasing the size of the aperture effectively. So you dielectrically load in the aperture is another way that the microwave engineers might talk about this. Okay. Uh, and so you're playing off this fourth power scaling uh, or the third power scaling of, of Rayleigh scattering versus the fourth power scaling of aperture theory. And so you're, you're able to uh, restore yourself into a regime where you can actually trap very small particles. That's the idea, okay. So how does that work? So this is uh, the experimental setup, very simple. It's actually an inverted microscope, laser going through an aperture. You look at the transmission. And then when you see trapping events, um, when particles enter into the aperture, you'll see increases in the transmission. This is what the data looks like. So these jumps are increases in the transmission when 100 nanometer polystyrene particles enter into the aperture. And with even less than a milliwatt of laser intensity, or laser power, I should say, uh, we can hold on to this particle indefinitely. There's a jump initially, but then the particle doesn't disappear. Compare that with Askin's work, where he was using a green laser. Uh, so we're using, um, uh, this was a, a, a one micron laser, so much longer wavelength. Um, uh, and he was using 12 to 15 milliwatts, and he could hold on to a uh, 100 nanometer particle for 25 seconds. We're holding on to this guy basically indefinitely with less than a milliwatt of power, okay? Now, another reason you might want to use apertures is as opposed to plasmonics, okay? So I, I'm trying to distinguish what I'm doing from plasmonics. A lot of what people do in plasmonics is build these like nano rods or things like this. The problem with that is they're, they're kind of thermally isolated from the environment. And so if you hit a resonance, you're going to increase the temperature up by, you know, 1,000 degrees Kelvin almost, okay, which is really bad. But if you have this aperture, you have all this gold around you, 
it's taking the heat away very effectively, and so you don't even get a degree Kelvin increase for the same local field intensity. Okay, so that's the key point. You, you're dealing, when you're dealing with biological stuff, you don't want to be like, like going to high elevated temperatures. Proteins will denature, you know, uh, 60 degrees, 45 degrees, whatever, depending on the protein and the environment, but you don't want to be up there. Okay, so we wanted to trap things that are even smaller than 100 nanometers, and to do that, we decided to design our aperture in a way that would allow us to, to um, sculpt the local field to be of the order of the size of the aperture. And so we use a double nano hole, and in a double nano hole, uh, the appeal of this for me was that if you could make one hole, you can make two holes. And if you can make two holes, you can bring them closer together, and at some point you're going to get these sharp apexes where they start to overlap. And this is, does the job of focusing the field to very small uh, gap distance, and so then you can imagine you can trap much smaller particles in this gap. So this is essentially what the experiment looks like. It's the same as, um, as before. You have uh, particles that are diffusing around randomly in solution in an inverted microscope, in a microwell. And when you all of a sudden trap a particle, you see a huge jump in the transmission. This is a 20 nanometer polystyrene particle. This is actual data. It's not a subtle change, OK? It's like 20% like change in the transmission. But the other thing you see is the particle moves around a lot, so you actually see the diffusion or the motion of the particle in the trap. And so you notice the noise here. This is the noise from your laser and your detector. But this is actually noise that's predominantly coming from the particle moving around. So we're getting information about the particle from its motion in the trap. Okay. Uh, very simple setup. You know, we just make these uh, double nano holes in gold films, uh, 100 nanometer gold films on glass. We use a, a spacer that you buy from Grace Biolabs. You put a drop of whatever solution you want to look at onto a microslide. We use a, a, a slide zero to, to really be able to come in with an oil immersion, but that's not essential. We've done it with other types of microscope objectives. And then you create this micro well uh, by putting the gold upside down onto this thing, and then you can do the trapping. This is kind of what the setup looks like. It's just an inverted microscope um, with a laser coming in. We, we use the, the Thor Labs uh, trapping tweezer system as our starting point, but then we add different detectors and we change out the lasers a little bit just to be more um, uh, better suited for application. And this is kind of what the, what, the actual, um, what the actual trapping event would look like if you're in the lab and you're just kind of running the experiment. You'd see, uh, when you see trapping, you see a jump. And actually, this is the, the camera that's recording. You know, I'm not sure if you noticed that, but the actual beam pattern changed a lot, too. So there's a lot going on there, and it's not a subtle effect. And these are just 20 nanometer particles. I'll just show that again. Just for those who missed it, pay attention to the, especially to the, um, to the camera image. Like when the particle gets trapped, it really changes a lot. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Okay. So uh, when we first started working on these, uh, like we did the first aperture work in 2009 or 2000, yeah, 2009. Uh, when we first started working on the proteins, this double nano hole, 2012, we could trap actually a single protein. Okay. So we trapped bovine serum albumin. And actually, this protein uh, exists in two different states. It, it has a cleave uh, in it, and it can open up and close. And we can see those, the transitions between there. So we're actually looking at protein folding and unfolding uh, in the trap as well. Um, so let me jump right into an application. This is something, this is a work in progress, OK? Uh, and, and this is something that we're working on right now, OK? But we've already published one work on this. So the application is P53, OK? How many people know what P53 is? OK. <laughs> OK, so you guys need an intro to P53. P53 was like protein of the year in like 2000 and whatever. I don't know. It's, it's, it's mutated. OK, so your body produces proteins. They do all the jobs in your body. Um, if, they, if you have the wrong DNA sequence or something, then you can produce a protein that has the wrong amino acid at a point. So this is a point mutation. That's called a mutant, OK? Now, this mutant protein, um, it's not going to do the job as well as the regular protein. Uh, in some cases, it's really bad. Uh, but in some cases, you can live your whole life and do pretty well until you get old, and then the proteins are not going to function as well. Uh, and P53 is a case where it's, it's an anti-tumor protein. It's a protein that, that basically works and protects the integrity of DNA uh, and makes sure you don't get cancers. But later on in life, you're more likely to develop cancers uh, if this protein is mutated in your body. In fact, over half of the known cancers in humans have a mutation in this protein. Okay? So it's, playing a it's the body's natural defense 
against cancer, and and it's um, and it's uh, when it's mutated, uh, you you got a much higher chance of getting cancer. Okay, so here's the wild type. Okay, this is the mutant type. This is in different environments and different uh, structures that they can have. Um, but the key point here is what people are investigating is when you add zinc or metallochaperones to these, these proteins, the, the mutant, you can get them to behave like the, like the wild type. Okay? So, so here the wild type is functioning in a way that's binding to DNA. Here uh, the mutant is not really uh, folding down in the correct way to do that. But if you add these zinc uh, particles, then you can actually get it to, to work again. So that's the idea. And there are clinical trials going on right now uh, to, to provide these as drugs for, these metallochaperones as drugs for, uh, for uh, anti-cancer. Okay, so we want to use our tweezer to, to kind of interrogate things like this. So, so here is a, a single strand of DNA, but it's a hairpin, okay? So that means that we have the complementary sequence on the second half of the DNA, so it folds in on itself and, and, and binds up uh, or zips up and creates this hairpin structure. Okay, if you just trap a single strand of DNA like this, uh, 20 bases, uh, you get a jump in the transmission through the aperture. But if you trap the hairpin, you get an initial step, and then you get a second step. Now, you notice that the total jump is the same height as the jump uh, for, for the, the regular DNA that's not hairpinned. But with the hairpin, it spends some time in this intermediate state. So f what we postulate in here is first you trap the hairpin, and then the hairpin unzips in the trap, okay? And the reason this happens is because uh, the electric field will essentially pull apart the, the hairpin through electrostriction. This has a higher polarizability than this object, okay? So it's a force that's acting to, to pull apart the hairpin. So the time that it takes to pull apart this hairpin tells you how tightly bound uh, this DNA is, okay? So now let's... Um, add P53. So P53 forms um, the sort of uh, uh, structure around DNA and it can hold it down. And this time now, this intermediate time step, goes up by two orders of magnitude when you add the P53. Okay? So this is, this is just the DNA and this is the P53 with DNA. Okay? And so we do a bunch of trapping events and we do cu cumulative statistics on how long does it take to get from this state to this upper state and for the, when you add the P53, the time increases by a factor of approximately 100. Okay. So it's not subtle. Okay. Now let's see what happens when we have the mutant. Well, if you add the mutant P53, which still binds to the DNA with almost the same binding constant, we see no change between them. So the mutant's not doing its job of holding onto the DNA and keeping it zipped up. Okay. So now the plan, the, the experiments we're doing, this was published in 2014. And I've had a, a lot of turnover with graduate students and everything. Abe actually also went to University of Michigan uh, to work um, there, uh, following Yunjie. Uh, and now the plan is to go with the metallochaperones and see if we can make this mutant behave again like the wild type. So this is an assay for discovering or seeing the physiological function of metallochaperones in P53 correction at the single molecule level. Okay. So that's what we're working on now. Of course, you can look at protein. Uh, this is bovine serum albumin or human serum albumin. Uh, and, and you can come in with antibodies and they'll bind and you can see the binding events as well. Uh, there's lots of different things that we've looked at. I want to focus a little bit on this noise that I talked about earlier in the trapping setup. When, when the particle gets trapped, it moves around and you see this as f intensity fluctuations in your signal through the aperture. Uh, and so if you look at just the size of the, of the, the noise, so the, the basically the how broad is that, um, how broad are these intensity fluctuations, how wide are they, then you notice that the, it correlates very well with the size of the protein, the molecular weight of the protein. So you can do this to basically measure the molecular weight of the protein that you've trapped. Once you've trapped it, you can say, okay, this is the molecular weight of the protein that I have. Actually, this one's kind of interesting. Uh, this protein is a, is a serpene. It's a triptych... Uh, uh, this is a triptych protein that will come in and usually eat, digest other proteins. Uh, but in this case, this, this serpene, what it does is it inactivates the triptych protein. When you cleave off this piece of this, uh, this protein over here, it forms like a rat trap that's, uh, or mouse trap that kind of 
flips the, the trip, uh, triptych uh, protein over to the other side and it activates it. But, so we measured, the, we measured the, the, the triptych protein and we measured the serpene individually and we got their molecular weights and they fell well on this line. But this guy over here, this, this vertical line, is the sum of the molecular weights of this guy and this guy. And we noticed that we were slightly displaced from the actual trend over here. And when we did the calculations, we found out that the piece that was cleaved off is equal to that molecular weight. So you can actually measure the, the molecular weight of a small fragment that's being cleaved off of the, the protein. Okay, uh, there's also some correlation with the, 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 the time constants. So not only is it the amplitude of the noise, but also the, if you take the order correlation of the noise, you'll get the, the time constant, and, and that also correlates to the molecular weight. We didn't actually get very good correlation until recently we started to look at, okay, well, what's the power of doing single molecule studies? Well, there's lots of reasons to do single molecule studies. There's about five of them, okay? One of them is, is related to, uh, to uh, doing anything that involves dynamics. With a single molecule, you know, you just watch. But if you're doing an ensemble, you have to synchronize. Every guy has to start at the same time, right? So, so that's one of the advantages. Uh, another advantage is you can deal with heterogeneous uh, solutions and look at each part individually and get better statistics of the whole solution. Uh, and particularly, I'm interested in this for the point of view of looking at very dirty solutions. So things that you just, you know, take some blood and just start looking, just start trapping stuff out of blood, okay? And, or take some urine and just start trapping stuff and see what happens. So this is, uh, is we're looking at, at egg white, okay, which basically contains a lot of protein in it. And we're looking at two main proteins here. Uh, individually, we get their standard deviation and their time constant. We plot them for distant trapping events for ovalbumin and ovotransferrin, which is uh, conalbumin. And then we group these together, these proteins. We put them together in the same mixture, 50-50, uh, and then we can do the same experiment and what we see is some sort of grouping of, 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 the, of the time constants. So now we can start to do individual trapping on a dirty solution and, and see which, is, which of which uh, protein we have in there. So then we just take egg white, which has a whole bunch of proteins in it, and we do a whole bunch of trapping events and we, we, we basically look at uh, the, the time constant and the, the standard deviation uh, as a function of, uh, we plot them for each trapping event and we can correlate uh, where the proteins are in terms of the molecular weight, okay? And so we can do some sort of constituent analysis of, of the mixture here and figure out what's in there, okay? So this negative two-thirds slope is what you'd expect from the theory. I don't have time to go into that. Uh, but just actually looking at the, the time signatures, uh, the time traces here, you can look at um, ovotransferrin. Uh, you can look at this, this noise here. Uh, and then you can also look at... at, at um, what we got from the actual egg white, okay? And these look quite similar. It's hard to appreciate how similar they look without uh, comparing something like ovalbumin, which is very different. Obviously, this is very different from this, okay? Uh, so they look very different. Um, and ovomucoid's another one, which also looks different, okay? So you can really kind of see which protein you've trapped without any markers, without any fluorescence or anything, just, just by looking at how it moves around in the trap. And so based on this, we came up with some constituent analysis uh, or composition analysis of egg white. And we can do it on the basis of molecular weight. We, we don't have as good resolution as, as we did previously, uh, mainly because of the experimental uh, setup or the, the, how well it was run, but, but essentially it's still pretty good. Uh, and we can get good sort of, uh, these proteins all fall in this range uh, of molecular weights and we get basically the right compositions based on what's been published in other literature. Okay, so I've talked about proteins, I've talked about protein DNA interactions, I've talked about protein um, uh, protein protein interactions uh, and uh, antibody interactions. Now I'm going to talk about protein small molecule interactions, okay? So a lot of drugs are small molecules, okay? So here's an example where we do essentially the same thing. We trap in uh, streptavidin and streptavidin has, is a tetramer. It has four barrels that bind, each bind biotin, okay? Biotin is a, a vitamin, okay? And uh, so if you don't have the biotin here and you zoom in closely on this noise spectrum or the noise, the time of the light transmitted through the aperture, you see it fluctuates, it has, but it has like a sort of an on-off kind of behavior. It's not like just solid noise. It's not like white noise, right? So, so there's some character to this noise, okay? And so we look at that and then we say, okay, well, what happens when you add biotin? When you add biotin, 
you don't really see, occasionally you might see some of that, but, but for the most part, it looks more like just white noise, okay? So, so we do the autocorrelation, and really, uh, streptavidin by itself has a very different time constant than, than biotin with streptavidin. Okay, and this is a small molecule. This is like less than 2% of the molecular weight of the, of the streptavidin itself. The complex is very small. Uh, so then you can think, okay, well, what other things can bind to proteins? Well, aspirin binds to uh, cyclooxygenase, and when it binds, you do see the exact same change in the time constants as well, okay? Uh, so these are all kind of interesting, and then we also looked at, like, streptavidin that had different parts of the, of the it's, I said it's a tetramer, but people have created mutants where only one part of the tetramer is actually uh, active, so uh, it's called monovalent streptavidin, and so, uh, you know, you can distinguish between monovalent streptavidin, regular streptavidin, and both of those when you add biotin. All of these fall on different curves. So you can really tell a lot about the type of protein that you have, whether it's mutated, how it interacts with, with small molecules. You can look at, now, obviously, streptavidin is one of the strongest, streptavidin and biotin is one of the strongest bonds uh, that you can have. Um, uh, but, uh, but you can also look at situations where, which is probably more interesting, where the protein will bind to a small molecule, but then it will also unbind, so it associates and dissociates. And there, the reason to do that is to get kinetics. Okay, so again, single molecule studies allow you to do kinetics at equilibrium, which you cannot do in, in ensemble measurements. In ensemble measurements, whenever you're doing a binding curve, you're always away from equilibrium and you see how you approach the equilibrium value. But in single molecule studies, you're watching binding and dissociation in real time and so you can get the kinetics that happens without actually at the equilibrium value, okay? Uh, and so that's, that's somewhat powerful, I think. And so we looked at these different uh, HSH, human serum albumin, binding with two different known drugs. And, and there's been a lot of literature on these drugs. And, and so the, the uh, affinities in terms of the molarities have been published in the literature. And then so what we do is we just measure the on time and the off time. Uh, and, and from that, at a single concentration, Okay, we don't do like a titration or anything like this. We just do a single concentration. We can figure out what the affinity is. Okay, and so, and we get values that fall in the ranges produced in the literature for sure. Okay, so this is a way to do uh, kinetics at the single molecule level on like a, basically a single molecule uh, at a single concentration. You don't have to do, uh, um, you know, do all different solutions of different concentrations and figure out what the binding constants are. Okay. Uh, we were working a little bit with um, a drug company, Vertex, there in, uh, the, we're working with the branch in San Diego and Torrey Pines, uh, and they're interested in mutants and how to correct them. They have a drug that corrects cystic fibrosis. It's probably the first small molecule drug on the market. So somebody who would have died from cystic fibrosis will, will live uh, basically a normal life. It cures cystic fibrosis certain, for certain mutations. They're interested in seeing if our approach can work and we looked at some of their proteins and we were able to see differences uh, with the protein and how it interacts with different things. So we could see that, that we will actually get in there. Um, they lost interest mainly because they thought it wasn't ready for prime time. You know, this technology, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it doesn't trap like right away every single day, you know. And so they had a lot of questions. We couldn't answer the questions. So, so I think they kind of moved on uh, from this. But I still have a lot of, I see a lot of promise, and they, initially they saw a lot of promise in this as a technology for being able to do drug discovery and, and analysis and proving the physiological mechanisms at a single molecule level of how the drugs are actually working. Okay. So I'll say that's part one of the talk. Okay, part, part two. Okay, so uh, talking a lot about uh, Raman and cavities, uh, or, or Raman, um, I've seen a lot of nice Raman work earlier on and using it as a probe. Uh, interesting thing uh, is, is, you know, vibrations, they're kind of related to, um, to uh, the, the size of the particle that's vibrating. And so there's been a lot of work. It's kind of like the, the community of cavity optomechanics is kind of combining now with the Raman community and they're starting to learn from each other a little bit, you know, the quantum limits of all this. I'm not really personally interested in the quantum limits. But, but essentially, these communities are kind of coming together uh, inevitably because as you make things smaller, uh, the frequency increases, and you go from, from, from sort of, uh, you know, cavity optomechanics where you have macroscopic mirrors and they, you know, 
doing gravity wave detection to down to the level of, of these uh, micro resonators that are you know, gigahertz types of vibrational frequencies. But now let's ask ourselves what happens when we talk about light interaction with things like, like single proteins. Okay, well these proteins, their vibrational modes, because they are a couple of nanometers across their vibrational roads, are kind of around the terahertz regime. Okay? So this is kind of where, where we're going, is, is looking at this low frequency realm on, to understand about the motion of, of proteins and, and how, they, how that works, and nanoparticles in general. Okay. If you go even smaller than proteins, if you go to uh, you know, C60, the lowest order modes are going to be you know, 8 terahertz, 15 terahertz around there. Okay. So these are, the, these are the Raman active modes, uh, L, equals, uh, L equals 2 and L equals 0. So the breathing mode and the accordion mode. Okay. So we want to listen to these, uh, these proteins and we use this process of extraordinary acoustic Raman scattering. Uh, and the reviewers of our paper said, you know, this is not really extraordinary. If you want to say something's extraordinary, you have to provide extraordinary proof. And so they made us redo a whole bunch of experiments, and it was quite frustrating. But uh, I like that it spells out ears, because essentially we're listening to the proteins, okay, what sounds they make. Okay, so we do the same laser tweezer setup. The only difference is we use two lasers, okay? So this is like a stimulated Raman experiment almost, except there's one very important difference. Okay, so we use these two laser tweezers, uh, two lasers, they have slightly different frequencies uh, that creates an intensity modulation at the beat frequency between these two uh, lasers. Uh, so the difference frequency gives you some beating, okay, and so you get a, a beating in intensity, uh, and you can scan that beating frequency from, you know, tens of gigahertz up to terahertz, or several terahertz, uh, by tuning the lasers, okay. Uh, but this intensity modulation then will modulate the, the vibrational modes of the nanoparticle that we have trapped in the laser tweezer. And when you hit the vibrational resonance of this nanoparticle, all of a sudden what we observe is an increase in the noise. Okay, so we're not doing stimulated Raman in the sense that you kind of will be looking for, um, you'll be looking for a coherent signal, you'll be looking at the light. We're actually just looking at the particle moving around. Okay, so that's the way that we measure. It's, different, it's a different way of measuring than some of the Raman. We're measuring how the particle moves around more. So we sweep the frequency difference between these two lasers, and at some point you'll hit a resonance of the particle, and so you'll get an increase in the noise, and then when you sweep off resonance, you'll get a decrease in the noise. And these are actual data taken, you know, when you're on resonance and when you're off resonance. This is a bent histogram of, of these fluctuations. Okay, so to calibrate the setup, we use things like uh, polystyrene nanoparticles, size standards, um, and you get these L equals uh, 2 and L equals 0 modes. Uh, the vertical lines are what you would expect from Lamb's theory, and so we, we believe that we're actually observing these modes for this 20 nanometer particle. But then when you change the particle size, the modes shift in the way that we expect them to shift. Okay, so you can actually observe something that you believe is real. Uh, now, compared to low frequency Raman, this has pretty good resolution. Compared to microbrion scattering, which is essentially the same thing as far as I'm concerned, uh, maybe the resolution is similar or slightly better, but uh, it really, you know, I've never seen microbrion go below 200 nanometer particles. So here we're talking about like 20 nanometer particles or single, single proteins, okay, which I'm going to get to in a second. Uh, so you're really going down to very low frequencies that uh, with very high resolution that hasn't, for very small particles that have never, that never really been accessed before, as far as I can tell. Okay, well, the resolution is so good that you can resolve, this is a titania nanosphere, and, and you can resolve splitting in the, in the acoustic modes of titania, because titania uh, has an anisotropic crystal, and so you're going to have different sound velocities along different axes, and each of these will have a different resonance for the L equals 2 mode. And so you can actually observe this in the, in the, in the setup, which is kind of nice. So that's a pretty small separation. It's, you know, five, six gigahertz separation. So it's quite a, quite a, quite a nice uh, resolution there. Of course, proteins, uh, if you trap them, you can also do the sweep. And all of the proteins that we trap in here all show, there's five different ones. These are from a size standard kit. They all show different signatures, okay? So essentially, we're able to identify uh, the proteins based on their, their spectra. And then we try to come up with a theory that would describe this, and our theory was pretty, uh, pretty simple. Essentially, we made the protein, we did an elastic network model of the protein, uh, figured out where the vibrational resonances were, 
And then we fitted that with an ellipsoid and looked at the stretching coordinate to look at the Raman activity or the Raman index of these proteins. And although these proteins have lots and lots of different modes, uh, only certain ones are very strongly Raman active. Okay? So, so there might be a small part of the protein that's moving at a low frequency, but that's not the one that's actually giving you the dominant signal there. So, so it's kind of hard to correlate you know, what we observe in experiments with what we actually see uh, in theory. Um, we, we're trying to kind of make some correlations here. Uh, certainly things look pretty nice, uh, but there's a lot of things you don't really see very well uh, in the... So this is, this, is, this is theory and experiment, okay? So, and here's another example, two more proteins. You know, it's not perfect, but, but it's a good, first, a good first attempt, I think. Uh, of course, you can trap uh, and do the same experiment with, with DNA. I've shown you DNA already. Uh, here's a single strand of DNA. Um, again, when you hit the resonance, you're going to have an increase in the noise. This is just showing that again when you sweep in the frequency. For uh, off resonance, you're going to have lower, uh, lower amplitude of the noise. When you hit the resonance, you're going to have a larger amplitude of the noise, and you can map that out as a function of the sweep. Okay, so uh, a, a single strand of DNA is essentially just a spring. Okay, you're just pulling on a spring, uh, or masses, on a, masses connected by springs. We know the spring constant from AFM measurements. Uh, we know the masses of the bases, so you should be able to protect all the resonances of this. And, and you know, they match up well with what you'd expect. Now, the nice thing is all the different bases have slightly different masses. And so you, get, you can get basically different resonances based on, the, on which sequence you use. And we have probed that here. All of these sequences have the same number of bases, but different actual sequences. And you can see you can distinguish between them in this experiment. So that's kind of a weird way of, of looking at these guys. OK, so I think I've, I've basically shown you that we can uh, probe into this regime um, of, uh, of single molecules, and we look at proteins, we look at protein-protein interactions. Uh, I haven't really talked too much about complexes. I talked a little bit about triptych inhibition. Um, so as a summary, I'm, I'm gonna, I actually have some extra slides, so I have some extra time, so I, I'll talk about some of the other work we're doing here, uh, which is not necessarily single molecule, but, uh, or we can stop for questions and then I can go back and talk some more. But just as a summary of what we can do with this approach, protein DNA interactions, protein protein interactions, protein small molecule interactions, so particularly for drugs, uh, protein sizing, uh, looking at heterogeneous samples, dirty samples, just looking at single molecule level. Uh, oh, I didn't show this. I, I have some slides on it later. We've trapped virus particles as well. Uh, the acoustic vibrations of viruses are interesting. People, there were some grants, you know, in the 90s, I think, where people were thinking, okay, well, viruses have a very well-defined frequency. Uh, and so if we come in with, with RF radiation or, or come in with some radiation, we can selectively destroy all the viruses in your body. Well, like kind of like, <laughs> so that was kind of the thinking. And, and people did some good work on that uh, in, uh, uh, before 2000 for sure. Uh, we can size nanoparticles and anal analyze them. And now we've looked at proteins and their vibrational modes. Okay, so that's my group uh, and some of the funding. Um, yeah, maybe I'll spend five minutes just yeah. hitting the high points of, of some of the other stuff that I have here. Okay, so I was really worried about this, this, this optical tweezer trapping thing. I didn't really believe it that much. I mean, I, I, they, we, were getting, we were getting data, <laughs> and it was, like, reproducible and consistent. Uh, but at the same time, I was like, well, why are we seeing so much signal? And I don't really understand it. So I, I basically told my student to go just do a standard four-wave mixing experiment. So, so run two lasers across from each other. These will interfere and create a gradient um, if you cause in these particles to vibrate in solution. So this is not a single molecule or a single particle experiment anymore. There's, there's, there's a large number there. And, and then you come with another laser and you look at the, the this, will create, this gradient will, will diffract this laser and make it reflect. Uh, but it actually also, because this, this gradient, these are two different frequency lasers, the gradient is moving and so there will be a Doppler shift of the diffractor beam. So this is a standard four-wave mixing, nearly degenerate. So they're almost the same frequency, nearly degenerate four-wave mixing. The nice thing about it being nearly degenerate is you don't have to do phase matching so much because they kind of all have the same, the same frequency almost. Okay, so, so this is the optical tweezer experiment that I showed you before. Uh, and then we took the same nanoparticles, these NIST size standards. They have pretty narrow, uh, the, they're, they're pretty monodisperse, okay. 
And we did the same experiment, full wave mixing, and we got these same peaks. Okay, and this one's a little bit harder to see, but it's there. Okay. So, so actually these particles are, are actually given a signal, a real full wave mixing signal in solution, even though we're losing pretty low intensity CW lasers. And so this is very interesting because this is a pretty large nonlinearity, okay, for these nanoparticles. And so we didn't really understand that part well, but at least I was happy to see that we could get the signal another way uh, rather than just optical tweezers. What's interesting is like these two nanometer uh, gold particles, they have pretty high frequencies. And I was thinking about using these for ultra fast optics, nonlinear optics, okay? So 1.5 terahertz is so sort of picosecond type of vibrations. These are two nanometer gold. This is a five nanometer gold. The same amount of gold in this solution as there is in this one. Okay, it just this one, because, it's, uh, because of the size scaling, it looks clear compared to this one, which is, it looks very dark, obviously. So why do we see such a strong signal? You know, if you do the calculations, uh, it's a good thing we didn't do the calculations first because we would have convinced ourselves right away that it's impossible to see anything. Okay, but then we do the calculations, we realize uh, that actually you, 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 we actually seen a huge uh, nonlinear response. And one of the things that we notice is that you don't see any signal for low laser intensities, but as you up, ramp up the laser uh, power, all of a sudden you start to see this full wave mixing signal. It's like a threshold. And so what we think is happening, these particles are vibrating, and that's usually heavily damped by water, but it pushes the water molecules away, and this creates a cavity around it, which allows you to actually have a much higher frequency oscillation. So even though your particles are in a viscous, very viscous medium at this lens scale, uh, they don't really see the material, the medium, because they push the water molecule away at a rate that's faster than the, the water molecule can come back. And so you can actually look at viscoelastic theory and a particle vibrating in vacuum and look at what experimental values we measure, and you see that we're somewhere between the two of those, okay? And so we've started to do, uh, actually we just submitted our first uh, paper on this. Uh, we're doing some simple uh, Leonard Jones uh, liquid model, and we move a particle around or we expand it in solution, and we do see this threshold behavior. So even very simple uh, molecular dynamics simulations will show you this threshold. Now, I'm gonna say something controversial at this point, okay? and why I think this is interesting, okay. So this is all very interesting because, you know, physics, whatever. But what's really interesting for me about this is why are proteins the size that they are? Okay, if you think about it, most globular proteins are like a couple of nanometers. Like in molecular weight, you know, typically tens of kilodaltons, 100 kilodaltons, but not much bigger, not much smaller than that, right? And I think these globular proteins, they're working in solution, and I think their normal modes are doing work. Their normal modes are responsible for a lot of the jobs that they do. And they pick that range because the, the vibrational modes are just higher than the, the characteristic frequency of water. So you don't damp out as much from the water. Okay, that's my very controversial and that's the part of this part that I think is really interesting, but we'll have to, we have to see where that goes. Okay, you can size nanoparticles, you can look at rods, you can look at tetrahedron, and you can get the, the, you know, the spectra for these. This full wave mixing technique, I think is like, you know, a lot of these colloidal chemists, they do, what do they do? They do light scattering, DLS, they do uh, uh, surface potential, and then they do uh, TEM, okay? But here you can get very accurate sizing in situ like for example, uh, oh, okay, sorry, I don't have, I don't have the paper here, but, but essentially we, we grew nanoparticles in solution and you could track their size and then compare it with the TEM, but you, it's basically like a light scattering measurement, but it's a lot more accurate in terms of getting their size. Uh, you can do extinction measurements, extinction measurements for nanoparticles don't give you a very good accurate uh, measure of the size. So I think this is a nice characterization technique that could potentially be used in any colloidal chemistry lab. Uh, these are other people looking at proteins. Other people have sh said that proteins are underdamped, but they're mainly looking at terahertz. I think like some of the lower frequencies are interesting. Um, okay, okay, a whole bunch of junk now. Sorry, I've just kind of randomly put stuff at the end of this, of this thing here. That's mainly what I wanted to say, but uh, let me just see if there's other stuff here. Oh yeah, I wanted to just show you the virus stuff. Oh 
Okay, so we trapped the virus. Okay, so you see this, it's MS2, it's one of the smaller, uh, it's a bacteriophage, okay. We try to get the, the spectrum from it as well to try to figure out the resonance frequencies where. Uh, we can also make these nano, uh, double nano holes by some template driven technique, which allows us to f uh, mass produce these without having to do focus line beam milling of the nano holes every time. Uh, what's really interesting to us is to put this on the internet optical fiber. So we've done this. Uh, you take an optical fiber, you coat it with gold, and you put double nano holes in there. We also work in ways of combining this template stripping with the optical fiber, so we work on that now. But the beauty there is you can go and put these in, like, you know, sort of um, in these sort of like uh, microwell type of probe stations, and you can imagine running like eight trap in setups in parallel. Uh, each of them just go dipping into a, a, a micro well. You trap on the end of the fiber and you see a jump. Uh, and then you can, you can imagine doing this at the scale where you don't actually even need the microscope anymore. So it becomes very, uh, very uh, scale upable. Uh, we've also done conventional Raman. Okay, that's it. So with that, I'll end and I'll take any questions that you have. Thanks. Um, the particles themselves each individually scatter, but not a lot. Okay, so essentially we're using a sort of an effective medium theory. When electrostriction makes the particle elongate or changes the shape, it changes the local refractive index. And so this creates a local grating. Uh, and the grating is actually moving because the particles are oscillating. So as, as, it, as it contracts, the refractive index effectively goes down. And so then it'll expand and contract and expand. So that then makes a, a moving gradient, which will reflect or actually uh, defract, is more correct, the, the incoming beam. So yeah, it's, not, it's not, a, not necessarily a scattering particle. It's more like a continuum. Yeah. Transfer energy in those modes, mm. and then you temporarily change the effect of because the molecules are now higher. I think it has to be coherent. It has to be coherent. coherent yeah, because yeah, because you you pump in at the difference frequency, uh, and then you come in with a laser, uh, and it and diffracts that. Um, so it's important that all of your your particles are in sync with each other. Well, they will be in sync. Yeah. Because, uh, so that's what I mean by coherent. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so you alluded to this in the beginning, or like right at the end actually, mm. uh, you had you know, eight traps. It seems like multiple actually is definitely the way to go. If you can, if you, if you go and it depends on, I mean, I think I, I presented this to the guys at Vertex and they laughed at me because, you know, uh, they, they actually weren't interested in this for drug, drug discovery so much. Um, but I'm interested in it for drug discovery because I think, you know, if you can, if you have an assay like our, our, our DNA one, then you can start to test a whole bunch of different compounds. And so multiplexing is, is the way to go, yeah. So with the, uh, yeah. before you introduced the idea of having multiple traps, yeah. all of these measurements are done on one. Yeah. Uh, essentially, uh, all of the, the traps that we make, or we have a high yield on the fibbed fabricated traps. Uh, they do foul pretty quickly, so you can run an experiment a couple of days, uh, but after that, you got to worry about the surface fouling and That's stuff getting so stuck in there. Well, if you trap something and it just gets stuck on the surface, then, then you don't see the signals change anymore, you don't see jumping anymore. Uh, surfaces can also get fouled in other ways. They can pick up charge. Then it just basically repels everything that comes close by. Um, 
much yes. the size of the physical size of the child, the potential well that you create. Because you see what mm. you're saying, you work with every time you get one particle in there, but I can assume that I yeah. think you get maybe two or three. Yeah, the reason you, I showed, I showed, I quickly went over one slide with what happens when you get two particles. Occasionally that happens. Uh, usually in the larger traps, uh, you see a single step and a second step. And they're, they're kind of almost the same height. Romain Kidon also published data like this. So we had seen this right from the beginning, but it was only later that we started to, to publish it. It's less common than just a single particle. The reason being that most particles in solution, by virtue of the fact that they're remaining in solution and not you know, binding together or falling out, is they have some charge on them and they repel each other. Okay, so, so they're not, once there's one in there, it's kind of saying, okay, you know, it's full, right? So, so it's, not, it's not common to get multiple trapping. The size of the actual physical trapping region, um, you know, we, we did some studies. I also showed, quickly showed some data where we changed the size, and we showed that it's optimal to have a trapping region which is like five nanometers larger than the thing that you want to trap, which makes sense. You want to confine the electromagnetic field to kind of the size of the particle. But, you know, uh, that has limits. The smallest kind of gaps we can make are like 10 nanometers across. Uh, but that's with this template stripping approach. To reliably get gaps, we can say 30 nanometers is what we can do reliably. Yeah. We, we have tried this, yeah. Uh, uh, work in progress, I guess. Uh, we had a student who... who uh, started to trap with pulse laser. One of the things we were really interested in is the pulse laser has much larger instantaneous electrostriction, right? So, so you can imagine it's, uh, and you could imagine doing these like Oki type of measurements, like pump probe type measurements to probe the same kind of things that we're doing here. Um, and so we're thinking about doing that and, and the student managed to get the trapping working with the femtosecond laser but then uh, left and then uh, for personal reasons and then actually ended up coming back to my group but when he came back, we decided to put him on another project. So, so uh, it's on the horizon, but you know, we have limited bandwidth in terms of what we can do. I'm more interested in really trying to get the P53 working, stuff that I think will have a broader impact in terms of, yeah, but certainly from studying the physics, uh, femtosecond stuff is, or even picosecond stuff is, is where we want to go with this. I mean, with, where a lot of people want to go with this. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. This is the part where I delete the whole presentation. <laughs> no, no, I think I just turn it off. Oh, I just turn it off like that? Okay.